Well, welcome everyone to the Gallery of Modern Art here in Brisbane for the first in a series of five uh, free GOMA conversations organised by the Gallery in partnership with ABC Radio National. Um, I'm Anthony Fennell, as you just saw, and uh, I present the program Future Tense on Thursday mornings on Radio National. Um, I should say also welcome to all of those who are joining the conversation tonight live via our webcast. And uh, I, I should also mention that at the end of the program, if you've got questions, we will be going to questions. And we are also accepting tweets, so if people want to tweet us, either out there or if you're watching via the webcast, uh, the hashtag is hash goma talks. That's G O M A talks, all one word. This series of conversations is being held in conjunction with the gallery's current exhibition, 21st Century Art in the First Decade. And the actual name of this particular talk is Communication Who Are We in the World of Web 2.0? Now, our intention tonight is to explore where the phenomenon of Web 2.0 has taken us as it's opened up our ability to engage and also to communicate with each other. And also, we want to probe how we feel about it in terms of privacy and also accuracy. So, before we go any further, let's welcome our guest for tonight. Okay. I'll just run through the names, and if you want to acknowledge yourself as I, um, as I read out your name, Ian Farmer. Me, thank you. Who's the managing partner and founder of Frontiering, a Sydney-based agency specialising in social media marketing. Uh, Andrew Frost, a writer, blogger, art critic and television presenter, known especially for his blog The Art Life and its associated television series. Ian McColl, a senior research fellow with the Faculty of Science and Technology at QUT, the Queensland University of Technology. And Ian, I'm told, has a particular interest in mobile media uh, literacy. And Jason Sternberg, uh, youth media and uh, or youth media, sorry, and popular culture culture commentator, and also a lecturer in media and communications at uh, QUT as well. So, welcome, guests. Um, where to kick off, Ian? I think Ian McColl. I think we'll start with you. Could you get us going with, I suppose, a, a brief definition of what we mean by Web 2.0? Sure, sure. I mean, I think I'd have to say, first of all, though, that the term itself has been around now for long enough that it's almost um, pretty much meaningless, and certainly there's been a lot of argument about it over the last five or ten years. Um, many people date it back to, to Tim O'Reilly, and then there's a, an argument between Tim O'Reilly and Tim Berners-Lee, and I guess there are really three things that um, emerge as the main focus. One of them is that the kinds of applications people have are very rich. They're very like desktop applications. That um, The second thing is that the data itself lives out in the cloud, out in the network where you can't touch it. And for tonight, perhaps most importantly, is that it's social. So it's about us. And, and Web 2.0, we're, really, we're not really now talking just about the internet, are we? I mean, it, it's gone past that. We're really talking about digital media, aren't we? I think so, yeah, yeah. And, and in fact, so um, Wired magazine in the second half of last year had an interesting article where they were arguing that the web is dead. And what they were partly basing that on was um, some stats from Andrew Odlisko that showed that the web itself, the sort of traffic that's generated on the internet from the web was in fact getting smaller. And the thing that was, and peer-to-peer -peer as well, so all of the BitTorrent and so on was getting smaller. The thing that was getting bigger was video. So where we are now, probably six months after that's happened, is that um, actual web traffic is decreasing. Um, and these days what we've got instead is an awful lot of video out there. Mm. Uh, Jason Sternberg, in terms of of the way we interact with each other using, using the various forms of digital media. The idea of Web 2.0, is it, is it so commonplace now uh, that, it's, that it's almost the norm? It, it's almost mainstream. It's reached that stage now where it's, I think it's fully embedded across virtually all sectors of the population as being another branch, simply another way of how we communicate. So. We've spent the past decade, I think, kind of writing or rewriting the rules of communication. And the ways in which that's happened have obviously sparked, you know, digital claims of digital utopia, you know, incredibly optimistic claims about how we will be able to live our lives online and collaborate on collaborate online. And on the other hand, you know, an incredible number of moral panics around privacy, around you know, what young people do with, with media um, in particular. I think what we're seeing now is kind of the mainstreaming of, that, of those communication practices where 
it's neither going to be as bad nor as wonderful mm. as anyone is actually predicting. Uh, and have we got to a stage where, I mean, it used to be the thing, didn't it, three or four years ago, that there was still a heavy focus when people talked about the potential of the web, the potential of digital media, to focus on the young. That there was this vanguard who were, who were doing all of this and we'd all, you know, we'd all follow behind. Uh, not saying that I'm not young. Uh, but has that changed as well? Have we had enough time now that uh, everybody's on board the train? Oh, pretty much. Um, I think, and it's always questionable with new media developments about the extent to which young people are at the vanguard. It's more a social myth that new media, new generations kind of get connected in this, in this narrative, you know, children of the future, young people of the future, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whether that actually plays out in reality, I, it's up for grabs. I mean, you always hear that one of the fastest growing demographic groups in the uptake of technology of the over 50s. Mm -hmm. So um, young people certainly tend to be early adopters, but I think we need to question the extent to which they're actually driving. They're actually driving the uptake of these of these um, digital technologies. Uh, Ian Farmer, you're you're a marketer. Yep. Uh, I was looking this afternoon online, and I, I looked at uh, at the term Web 2.0, and I came across a discussion that Tim O'Reilly, Tim O'Reilly, who's one of the people who's who's credited with coining the phrase, yep. that he had uh, a couple of years back, in which he said. He felt that the, the term uh, Web 2.0 had kind of got lost, the original intention of it. And he derided what a lot of people would call Web 2.0 today or, or were labelling you know, their services or their platforms as Web 2.0, saying that, in a sense, it had been co-opted by the marketers. And he meant that in a derogatory way. Sure, yeah. What's your feeling about that? Well, I think, I think um, marketing is still trying to engage with consumers in a Web 2.0 way. There's many websites and many ways corporations engage consumers in a very one-way traffic. It's still publications. Rather than, I would define Web 2.0 as open conversations that encourage and connect people. And I don't think, um, I think we're still early days of, of seeing that penetration happen in the marketing community. In a sense, uh, there's, a, there's a tendency for us, though, to, to concentrate on the technology, isn't yeah. there? Uh, but, I mean, even the question for this tonight is, um, you know, is, uh, you, you know, who are we in the age sure. of, of 2.0? Is that often forgotten by marketers? I think, I think we're learning more and more about how to use people's behaviour and then how we should use that in our marketing of, of products and services. And the beauty of the internet now is it leaves such an explicit trail versus water cooler conversation, which aren't really recorded. So conversations that are done online, whether they're comments or, or just um, you know, expressions of an opinion, is much easier to then mine for conversations and then start to personalise your communications against. Is it, as we've seen uh, a greater diversity in terms of the, just the sheer choice that we have, um, in terms of the tools that we can use to communicate with each other, yep. has it become harder for business and for marketers to actually do their job? Is it a much more fragmented landscape out there? Well, there's certainly a lot more clutter out there. Um, I think people have the same number of hours in the day and they've got a, a lot more communication messaging being thrown at them, whether it's on the TV, bus shelters, the internet and so forth. So it's a lot harder to break through the clutter if you're a marketer to get your message heard. Um, Andrew Frost, um, art and cultural institutions, they used to have um, a stuffy image, I suppose you'd say, and they used to be, well, the perception, I guess, is that art and cultural institutions used to be quite protective of what they did, what they saw as their core business. Uh, my experience over the last couple of years from people t talking to people in the industry is that that seems to be, in be changing, that they do seem to be embracing what Web 2.0 uh, offers, is, um, is that your perception? And, and if so, where are they at? Is the will there, but are they still struggling to work out what to do, or, or have they got past that initial stage? I think it's still very much in its early days in terms of a connection between art institutions such as GOMA and, and museums generally, and you know uh, the digital age, if you want to use that term. But I mean, it. 
I think it's it's in in terms of a demonstration of how it's evolved. I mean, initially, I think uh, like most most large cultural organisations, the the will was there to create websites and so forth, but that was the first phase. What we're experiencing now, say for example, with the recent uh, opening of the Museum of Old and New Art in, in Tasmania, Mona here at Goma and the Art Gallery of New South Wales in Sydney are about to launch a whole range of interactive uh, technologies within the gallery space. So people who come in can use their, you know, their phones and iPads and so forth to, to interact with uh, the exhibits. So I think that's probably the most prominent example of, of what you're talking about. But once again, it's really just a question of what the offering is in terms of the content on those, on those devices. Uh, and, and the integration of that. I mean, how important is, is, I suppose, the digital side of it, the interactive digital side of it, is that still seen, um, from what you're saying, as the, as the secondary role? You know, you set up the exhibition, you set up the things you want people to see, to, to walk around, to touch. Uh, and then the digital component, you know, you worry about that after you've done that, after you've set everything up. It's so fractured in terms of how uh, the museums and so forth are actually engaging with the technology to actually, to be able to effectively generalise and answer that question because, say for example, Goma has had, a, you know, a, a, a blog launched to coincide with uh, this exhibition with 21C, which I think is a, a fantastic example of the sorts of stuff that you can do online. But then, for example, uh, the Art Gallery of New South Wales is about to, in May, open a, a new wing, the Caldor Wing, uh, which will enable them, amongst other things, to put uh, 13,000 artworks online for the first time. Mm. So, I mean, in terms of what is happening, it's quite all over the place. And I presume, and correct me if I'm wrong, that that must, that must open up your definition of, of what is your audience. That, you know, a, a, an institution like GOMA here once had uh, an audience in Brisbane, uh, perhaps people from the rest of the state or the country or the overseas, if they came and visited the actual physical site. But we, we must be moving to a time where galleries, museums everywhere in the world have to start thinking about the rest of the world and about that audience that, that isn't ever going to be physically in their presence. Well, you would think so, but I can't think of a lot of evidence to, to support that <laughs> claim. I mean. Most uh, galleries have, uh, have websites and some, as I mentioned before, have started to investigate the possibilities of handheld devices. But um, just on a simple basis of what's being offered on websites, it's very basic. Mm -hmm. Opening hours, the collection, board of trustees and so on. It's not as though many galleries are actually doing anything with what they've got. Um, I've got another question on the, on the business side of it. So Ian Farmer, I'll come to you in a second, but Ian McColl, I'll, I'll I'll direct the initial question to you, and that's uh, the media theorist Douglas Rushkoff has questioned how many people actually realise that when they, they use a platform like Facebook, that they're operating in a commercial space as much as they're operating in a social space. Um, in your op opinion, has, you know, in the era of Web 2.0, has that connection between the commercial space and the public space or the social space, has that been blurred? Um, I, I don't think it's any more blurred than it is for any other media that, that we use. I mean, the, the connections are not necessarily um, explicit, but over time we become familiar with all the commercial opportunities that people are, are realising. So with television, for example, there, you do have that point where you're going from um, a particular television program to the ads that are associated with it and everyone is familiar with the notion of product placements where you get to see the the logos burning in the yeah. in the distance and so on and so forth so so I think people are actually pretty canny about the way that that the commercial world operates mm -hmm. and they accept that um, in a sense they're contributing something eyeballs their social network their connections whatever it is and in exchange for the service that that they're able to make use of um, they recognise that there are any number of ways that in some senses they're being exploited or there's some sort of transaction that's going on that, that someone's able to make money. So I think, um, I mean, I think this whole area is very new. We're talking about something that's really only existed for about 20 years or so. So the ways that people make money, the, the different kinds of ways that um, people's information or their, their um, attention or whatever are, is able to be exploited and also the services that are available, we're only at the very earliest time of working all of that out, I think. And, and it's, it's often, uh, I was going to say, not as transparent, but 
That's perhaps not the case. I mean, I suppose that the really successful social media sites uh, and search sites, say, like Google, have been successful because they've been very subtle about the way they engage in a commercial activity. Uh, so is that subtlety, in a sense, does that make it easier for people to not notice the commercial side of the platform mm. or, or uh, to not worry about the commercial side of the platform? I think uh, subtlety is probably the wrong kind of word to use for it, I think. I mean, I think Google's AdWords, for example, is, is a way of, um, in a sense, offering people a be better commercial offering. And similarly with Amazon and its recommender systems, that's very similar. Yeah. In one way, that's Amazon maximising its commercial opportunities, and in another, it's actually a, an opportunity for the customer to broaden. There is some, some truth behind um, the offering that AdWords or, or Amazon, I guess, offers. Um, on the other hand, Twitter, for example, is still desperately searching for what its ongoing financial model mm. might be. It's mm. not clear yet what, what model you can actually generate out of 140 character tweets. Uh, Ian Farmer, yeah. your thoughts on that? I mean, is it, where is the balance for people uh, in terms of the platforms that they use, the media that they use, between the commercial, the possibility, I guess you could say, at the, at the very worst end of exploitation, yeah. And, and what they want to do in terms of, of that connectivity, of that social side. Yeah, look, I, th I think it is blurring the lines a little bit. I think um, people are now um, being a little bit more cautious about what they present for themselves on a professional sense and on a personal sense. Um, it it kind of gets mixed up a bit in Facebook sometimes. So, you know, and, and we're still early days of Facebook allowing people allowing you to communicate to different lists of your friends, different messaging. So that's starting to happen now. But um, I, I think also it's going to drive a lot more niches in markets. So um, as people have different preferences, then they'll have a different um, product or service offering to that preference. Uh, we might take a tweet. Uh, we've got a tweet from uh, Ian Neal. Um, I'll open up to the panel, anyone who wants to answer this. He says, to what extent do you think Web 2.0 implies ideas such as openness, transparency and the commons? Anyone want to have a stab? They're absolutely, well, they're absolutely fundamental to it. Um, the, the question is, how do those ideas change in that environment? So how do our understandings of privacy, how do our understandings of, of openness change mm. in, that, in that environment? But they're absolutely fundamental to the idea of Web 2.0. But there is a, I mean, you still hear a lot of people almost, and, and we saw this with the, the protests in Egypt, yeah. uh, there is almost a utopian side of it, the, this idea that, um, that uh, digital media, Web 2.0, it's actually implicitly about helping the world. It's about doing better things. It, mm. it allows us to open up. It allows us to, to democratise things. That's not necessarily the case, though, is it? Oh, absolutely not. I mean, Web 2.0 is both... a bottom-up and a top-down process. Yeah. I mean, don't forget, the Egyptian government was working very hard to shut down a lot of websites yeah. as people were, as people were, you know, um, calling for revolution. So where Web 2.0 really exists is in that sort of nether region between the utopian space and the sort of top-down commercialised space. Um, and it's, you know, it's messy. And I think it, it, it follows on from the, some of the challenges facing any community, whether they're an online community or an offline community. When you get to a certain size or there's some value in the community, those that run the community have a vested interest in keeping the community in its current form and therefore Absolutely. want to resist change. Yeah. Mm. And, and the nature of the, the internet itself, though, um, I think is also going to operate in favour of the kind of openness and, and transparency. So that even where we see walled gardens of various kinds yep. arising, so there are, I mean, Facebook or the Chinese, the Great Wall of China or iTunes, any number of those are in some sense a way of trying to cordon off parts of um, the content so that they can be um, commercialised in certain ways. But the internet, I think, by design and therefore implicitly the web as well, tend to be able to find ways for people to work around those things. And so the openness and transparency, I hope, will stay, well, I think. Talking about cordoning off, I mean, Apple has been enormously successful at doing that, haven't they? Yeah. They've, yeah. they've managed to convince people that they can, they can cordon off and charge you, which a couple of years ago, 
uh, would have seemed, if Rupert Murdoch had, well, he's still trying to do it, it would have seemed an impossible task, but they've quite cleverly managed to do it, haven't they? Mm. Well, I mean, I think there is a difference between Apple and, and News Limited, though. So, so Apple is making, was making available something that wasn't previously available, whereas News is trying to take something that's already available for free and put up a paywall around it. And I think the, the sort of the value propositions and the expectations of the public around both of those are quite different. Uh, Ian, just picking up on a point that you made, I was going to come to Wikipedia because that's, uh, I guess that's the example that's always raised when we talk about the potential of crowdsourcing. It's always given as an example. Uh, an interesting thing that you said, though, was that when, uh, when organisations, in a sense, uh, they embark on this openness, they embark on, I guess you'd say, the crowdsourcing model, mm -hmm. when they become a certain size, uh, they've got something to hold on to. Yeah. Sometimes the attitude that they have changes. You could argue Wikipedia is very much like that, couldn't yeah, you? It's, I mean, it's, it's a lot harder to get things changed now, and their governance process is a lot stricter than it used to be, for that very reason. And uh, I mean, one of the criticisms I've seen recently of Wikipedia is that uh, there's almost a, that, well, there, there, there's been a hierarchy. Some people would say that's mm. crept into it. That that some people's contributions are now valued much more than, than yep. other people's contributions, which seems to go against that whole spirit of egalitarianism that, sure. we're, that, that we, we've been told the web is about. Yeah. Well, democracy only lasts for so long, you know. <laughs> you, need a, you need a strong <laughs> hand to deal with these people. <laughs> <laughs> strong hand on the whip. Um, Andrew, uh, picking up on Wikipedia and the whole idea of crowdsourcing, what's the potential for that uh, in in the arts area uh, for, for actually getting people actively involved on projects? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, it, it seems that the, the art world is, 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 as you would imagine, run along generational lines. And for an industry that is 90% concerned with the production and sale of paintings, uh, the use of the web is, is a new and wonderful thing to a lot of people. It's not exactly something that's, uh, that's being taken up. Um, I was proselytising the idea that, uh, for example, people could uh, start their own online art magazines when I uh, co-founded the Art Life in 2004 and I was looking at you know, the statistics that Technorati were throwing around that there were 26 million blogs in the world and it seemed like it was open for, you know, open for business. Anyone could get in and have a go. And the thing that was quite astounding over the last six or so years is that so very few people have. Mm -hmm. The old, uh, old media um, models of art magazines and that kind of dissemination of um, content is, is valued in a way that online uh, participation isn't. And that's not to say that there haven't been some fantastic projects where people have collaborated online to create online art projects and, or to you know, uh, pool resources and that kind of thing. But, uh, as, as far as an overall take-up is concerned, it's been, it's been negligible from my experience. Uh, will we, or are we getting to a point where those things are starting to level out? That, I mean, I work for the ABC. Uh, there's been an enormous amount of activity um, and excitement about what, what potential the online world and the social media world offers an organisation like ours. Uh, like your experience, some things have worked, some things haven't. People have responded in an enormous way to some particular projects, not to others. Are we getting to a stage where we're starting to, to get um, a, a bit more sort of um, reasoned discussion about how institutions and organisations should use uh, the different media that's out there and what will work for them and what won't, rather than an idea that you know, we've all got to have a blog, uh, we've all got to be, uh, have a social media um, platform, we've all got to be doing have an a, a iPhone app, that kind of thing? Well, the, the iPhone app uh, question is an interesting one because a lot of uh, commercial dealers in Australia have started developing their own. I know the number of magazines have started uh, developing iPhone apps because they see it as a real way to, to add some value to what they do, either to drive uh, readers to their online presence or to create some kind of you know, useful applications such as you know, galleries in, this, in town and who's open when and that kind of stuff. Uh, but I think the art world is much like any other end user is that they go to it and use it as they find it. Mm. For whatever purpose is, the purpose is kind of created post fact after they engage with it. I don't, I, as to a levelling out perhaps, I think that uh, you know, most people uh, have got over the kind of initial uh, excitement of the new technology angle to it mm. and are now looking to it 
quite simply to, to ask, you know, what can it supply me or what can I do with it and what, what, whether that activity is actually meaningful in some way for both the people who are providing the content but, of course, also the people who are using it. Because just briefly, I mean, it, it can be an enormous cost to an organisation in terms of, of not just money but also uh, time in terms of, of um, you know, human effort, can't it? Oh, certainly. I, I attended a conference a couple of years ago in which an opera company were trumpeting their uh, involvement with uh, Twitter and they had a Facebook page and, and they had a website and it was all integrated and someone pointed out that they had 30 followers. Mm. And uh, we never quite got to the, to the bottom of how much it actually cost. <laughs> they them, were the roadies for the opera company. Weren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Well, look I mean, you know, there was a will there to engage with it, but the, the actual effect of that engagement was, was, was a bit of an open question. And uh, if, you're, if you're joining the conversation via our live webcast, the question is, who are we in the world of 2.0? Uh, you can send us a, a tweet if you want to. The hashtag is hash GomaTalks, all one word. And our guests are Ian Farmer, managing partner and founder of Frontiering, Andrew Frost, a writer, blogger, art critic and television presenter, Ian McColl, a Senior Research Fellow with the Faculty of Science and Technology at QUT, the Queensland University of Technology, and Jason Sternberg, a Youth Media and Popular cultural, com, Culture Commentator, uh, and also a Lecturer in Media and Communications at the, University, or the Queensland University of Technology. I'm Anthony Fennell, by the way, the presenter of uh, Future Tense on Radio National, who's partnering uh, with this series of talks here at GOMA. Uh, Ian McColl, one of your interests is media literacy. I mentioned that at the beginning of, uh, of the session tonight. We know, you know that people of all demographics and right across the world are now using online and social media on a daily basis. Um, but one thing that's, that's, that has occurred to me is that does usage actually equate to literacy? It's an interesting question. I mean, I think... Um people make of media whatever purposes they, they see fit. So I think effectively they get out of it whatever they can or whatever they, they choose to. Um, and I mean, I, you know, I guess um, making the kind of distinctions that, that often get made between the different media um, isn't as useful. So I think really what happens is people are selecting from a whole range of media depending on their purposes at hand, the particular uses they've got in mind, the context they find themselves and, in and so on. Um, so I think, I mean, I, I guess I do think that, that people are literate in whatever media they seek to, to use and exploit and appropriate and, and turn to their own purposes. Uh, Jason, your thoughts? Yeah, I would agree. Um, a lot of what I do in terms of my research involves going out and watching people use media. Um, so I spend a lot of time watching people watch television and hanging around in the background, back of um, lounge rooms watching people use computers. Um, and my interest is on the, the creative uses to which people put, um, put, media, put media to. And I think the idea of literacy is not necessarily about being sophisticated, mm. is not about being you know, this, this notion of being media savvy. Quite often, me being media literate involves a decision not to use a particular medium. Mm. So I think what we understand as being media literacy is quite broad and creative. It's not necessarily a sophisticated use of media, it's more a practical use of media. Mm. And what I see people doing is integrating old and new media yeah throughout the fabric of their everyday lives quite seamlessly and quite... <laughs> a classic example, I, I get my students every year to go out and spend time with different households and watch them use media and interview people about their media use. And one of my students came back to me and said, oh, look, I was, I was, I was doing this interview with my family, with, with this family that I'm, I'm researching, and I was speaking to the mother and I said, so, you know, what, how, how much new media do you have in your home? And the, and the poor woman sort of had this puzzled look on her face and said, well, I guess the TV's three years old, so that's pretty new, isn't it? <laughs> old media, new media, social networking, yeah. real people don't use those terms. Mm -hmm. It's just whatever works for mm. them. 
I actually, I actually did a, a lecture with students a couple of years ago, and we talked about the different forms of media that were out there now. And I did a little experiment at the end and said, raise your hand if you, use, if you still watch a lot of television. Almost everybody did. Yeah. Raise your hand if you uh, use a, a, a platform online like Facebook or MySpace. A whole heap of people raised their hand. Went through all of them. And then at the end I said, now raise your hand if you actually just like to use a combination of one, two, three, any of those, yeah. and everyone raised their hand. You know, that yeah. sense that uh, I guess we often look at technology as though it's a progression and you've got to leave the other stages behind. Yeah. That's not necessarily the case, is it, Ian? And, and oh, there's also, an, uh, well, I'm coming around a long way to yeah. a point about anxiety, that people fret about not keeping up. Again, yeah. just before Christmas, I ran into a friend I hadn't seen for a couple of years. She asked me what I what program I was working on. Now I told her, and then she immediately apologised for not being on Twitter, <laughs> uh, which I thought was quite quite curious. She yeah. she was quite apologetic, and, and she felt quite guilty about the fact she felt she hadn't kept kept up with technology. Well, it's, it's certainly easier to keep that ambient connection now with the tools like Facebook of what people are doing. But yeah, there comes a point about when is that valuable to our society, and when is it you know invaluable? I guess. But um, I, think, I think there's been a lot of changes, not so much in literacy, but also in um, consumption of media, but also producing media. Like, it's very easy now to produce your own... Well, everyone's got digital cameras now, phones are digital cameras. So the production of media or mashing up someone else's media and adding your bit to it and then making it your own is, is a critical part, I think, of Web 2.0. Um, Andrew Frost, um, privacy. It's one of the issues, we're, we're fast running out of time, believe it or not, but privacy and the web. From time to time, uh, you know, we hear concerns raised about, uh, about privacy, about the way our data is being used, about how much data is safe for us or data, how many uh, facts about our life, I suppose, uh, we should actually put on, on websites, we should communicate through digital media. Uh, we hear those privacy issues, as I say, from time to time, but they're not there for an awful lot of the time. I mean, does that mean that by and large, uh, we're kind of okay with the, the whole privacy thing, that, that the, the broad public has kind of worked out where, where, the, where it sits in terms of privacy and what, what it'll accept and what it won't? I think it depends on the user and what the, the platform they're actually engaging with is to, to, to properly answer that question. I think that uh, when you sign up for Facebook or some other social media, I think uh, you know if you're aware of the kind of advances that you're giving and the kinds of ways that people can contact you or find out things about you mm -hmm. from the information that you supply, if you're cool with it, I don't see that it, that it is a problem. I think that the privacy concerns is a kind of contemporary version of the sorts of paranoia that used to revolve around you know, computers in the 60s and 70s, mm -hmm. the idea that if a government department had your you know, details on record, it was somehow dehumanising to you as a person. I think that the debate in terms of privacy now is kind of a reflection of that anxiety about what happens out there. Although having said, said that, I work with a community group uh, where I live and uh, they were very, very concerned that their names should not be mentioned on their community group blog in case someone got their names. I'm not quite sure what those people are going to do with their names. Perhaps mm. look them up on the yellow pages and find out where they live. I don't know. Yeah. But I mean, it was, you know, there is that consciousness there amongst a certain generation that if you if you're putting that information online, then somehow that you're compromised. But we do, we are more comfortable with it, aren't we? I mean, we know, I know, for instance, that anything I put on Facebook uh, is potentially out there uh, to be used at some point by somebody. Um, yes, I would be concerned about that, but I accept that that's, that's what I'll take on. I think, uh, you ha I think you have to re orient your notion of shame, of personal shame. <laughs> oh, so I much of your past life exists on the web that you, you have to come to you know, terms with it. Yeah. yeah, and that's not just a flip point either. I really do think one of the big transitions we've seen through Web, web 2.0 is a redefinition of no notions of shame, of notions of embar public embarrassment. It's just transparency, um, isn't it? We're tra more, much more transparent. But also but multiple yeah. identity, so that you may have one identity yeah. that you're ashamed of and another that, that you're not people, proud of. You know? People are not good at doing that. <laughs> They're and getting I, better. Yeah, and you know, e even young people who are, you know, who are supposed to be technologically literate are not good at doing that. Um, you know, I overheard a conversation in a computer lab between two students. One 
he, one guy had applied for a job and his boss had looked him up, had Googled him, mm. found some photos on Facebook, um, okay. didn't get the job, told him he didn't get the job. And his response was, I can't swear on... I can't, I can't <laughs> swear on... So like, this is, this is an edited version. <laughs> I'm 19, I get drunk, what do you expect me to do? So once upon a time, you would not mm. have that relationship with a prospective employer. You would not have, a 19 year old would not have that relationship with an adult. I think that is a fundamental shift and a fundamental change. And I don't know whether that's good or bad. The, there's yeah. a point too, isn't there, that it's not just, uh, it's not just shame, it's shame for a very long time. You know, that the, yeah. the, the point of that shame it's could fun. be up there on a website, uh, you know, theoretically, indefinitely, but, but certainly for, for a period of time. Just picking up on a point there, I, I was gonna reference uh, Douglas Rushkoff again. Uh, he was one of the first, if not the first, to use that term digital natives. And um, he's got a new book out called Program or Be Programmed, in which he questions how capable today's youth are at actually understanding uh, the whole online social media environment. And uh, you know, in f he believes, in fact, that because they've been brought up with it, they've kind of lost a perspective for what things used to, used to be like. So they're much, much more accepting of whatever's put in front of them, much, much less questioning. How do you feel about that? Any I, points on that? I think that's, I think that's true up to a point. Um, it's quite interesting because Douglas, Rush, Douglas Rushkoff and Sherry Turkle, two of the sort of founders of you know, web theory, have in many respects come full circle. I mean, Sherry Turkle's new book is entitled Alone Together, mm -hmm. and she's now concerned not with how we can play with our identity on the web, but with how we live our identity on the web. We have no other presence other than, other than on Facebook, other than on Twitter. I think it's a really interesting question. I don't, I don't think, in the, because I see them in the classroom, I don't think young people are as technologically savvy as we'd like to think they are beyond using these applications for social purposes. So if you try and explain to someone that you might need to write a blog in a professional context, I was met with confusion. Um, I, you wouldn't try and use Facebook in an educational context at all because Facebook is about is for talking about your teacher. It's not talking, it's not, doesn't exist talking to talk with, with your teacher. Mm. <laughs> um, so the way, the way young people use those technologies are very, very rudimentary in many respects. Uh, just a couple of quick tweets. Um, Kate JF, uh, echoing your point actually, Jason, being media literate, she says, means knowing when not to use media, not sophisticated usage. Yeah. And uh, in the time that we've got, we really should touch on this one. This is a whole new can of worms. Uh, uh, Ian Neal or Leon Neal, I'm not sure. Uh, where do you see hints of Web 3.0? Uh, in the semantic web, as uh, Berners-Lee says, Tim Berners-Lee, yeah. or a different model entirely? Ian McColl, uh, just onto that. I'll give that one to you. Um, I I, I guess I, I noticed that one there before, and I was thinking, I mean, I don't actually think that Web3 is necessarily the most interesting thing. I think the most interesting near-term development is actually about mobile. So the way that the web stops being um, on your desk, um, stops being on your lap, and it's actually in your pocket. It's yeah. with you everywhere you go. That's, that's I think, I mean, Tim Berners-Lee's um, web notion of Web3, I think, is really much more about a whole new range of services, but, but ultimately, as far as users are concerned, as far as the... Um, X billion people who are all on, on the internet and on the web. Mm. Web3 is not something that they're going to actually directly relate with. What they'll, they'll do is um, they'll work th with it through the various interfaces that they've got and increasingly that's going to be the one in their pocket. Um, look, I think we'll have to go to final thoughts uh, for the night. Uh, so, Andrew, um, a final thought. Can you ever see a time when, um, when the digital becomes becomes more important than the physical in terms of, of the art side of the equation, in terms of galleries and arts institutions. I know you said there's a lot of talk, but the, the reality hasn't matched up to the talk as yet. Uh, are you talking about the art object itself or the experience of, of interacting with an institution? Because well, that, that the, 
Yes, yeah. Well, I'm talking about both in a sense, but, but certainly whether uh, a museum or we get to the stage where a museum or gallery is more interested in the, the digital connection, if you like, than the actual, the actual work that they've got. I don't see that ever happening, to be honest. I, I think that the, the experience of art is very much a, is a physical one, one that's you know, in proximity to the actual thing. Um, for, for everything that a museum or, or cultural institution could do, it is really only, in a sense, an approximation of the kind of experience one can have standing in front of a painting or a sculpture. However, the kinds of artworks that could be made online or disseminated through digital media is a, is a, is a different question. And in that case, mm -hmm. probably yes. I think there will be a time when, when uh, museums and other galleries and so forth actually provide you with uh, an experience of an artwork through that me digital media, which is in, in a sense already happening, if, if, if very small and, and marginalised in terms of the exposure that it gets. So a, a bespoke, if you like, digital gallery, say, rather than uh, a traditional gallery deciding it wants a, a greater digital presence. Yeah, I could imagine that happening if it has not already had, you know, come to pass. Somebody hasn't already done it. Uh, Jason, and just briefly, so we've got time for questions, uh, we've already seen outbreaks of, of rebellion, I guess you could say, in terms of the Web 2.0 world. You know, it's not uncommon now to come across people who just say, I, lo I love it all, I've just got to get away from it. I've got to have, you know, Wi-Fi free weekend. There are Wi-Fi free cafes. You know, people are concerned about the pace of their life. Do you, is, is it possible that that will get past the rebellion? We'll actually see uh, to, to the revolution stage. I think it's part of a levelling off in yeah. people's use of um, technology. The thrill of the new is no longer there. And as these tools become more ubiquitous, people will just become more measured and in their use of them. I think it's, as, I think it's a early adopter, late adopter, laggard yeah. transition. Uh, Ian Farmer, authenticity. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a buzzword, isn't it, for, yep. uh, for marketing in particular. It is indeed, yeah. But it's, it, it would seem to me it's a bit of a double-edged sword because if you're striving for authenticity, you better make sure you actually are authentic. Yeah, that's right. And look, companies are moving away from um, using models and actors in adverts to using real people, telling real stories about real experiences, which I think is where the, the nutshell of, of marketing in Web 2, well, marketing 2.0 is, you know, real people real experiences about real stories that they have. We're a cynical lot though, aren't we? Yeah. I mean, yeah. We, we look at some of that stuff and we think they're not real people. Um, you know, how do you, because that authenticity, it's worth, it's a product, isn't it? it it's, it it's, it's worth something to market it. It is, yeah. And it, it becomes, then, then you start paying for those stories and then it becomes this issue of, you know, is it real stories now because I'm being paid for it? So there's this concept of declaring your payment for a story then to make it still hold that transparency attached to it. All right, and um, Ian McColl, you've started off, so we'll, we'll end with you. The, the sheer quantity of material available online, um, it, it, you know, that's part of, I suppose, the power and the digital allure, or mm. the allure, rather, of the digital world, mm. of, of Web 2.0. But, um, you know, as data storage starts to become an, an issue for companies, a real issue for companies, and, and we're even seeing this at the ABC from time to time, that there is just no service base left mm. anymore and they have, to, they have to cull. As that becomes much more of an issue, uh, do we get to a point where we, we, we say we simply have too much information out there? Too we much information isn't or... necessarily a good thing. Mm. So, so I guess you're, you're alluding to the possibility that we might deliberately forget things or we might leave things behind, which, um, I mean, that's, that problem has always been with us. The ABC has lost um, large quantities of its telecine history before any of the digital stuff started to happen. So those, that problem has always existed. I but think. I guess there's, there's been that idea that now where, where things were lost, in a sense, uh, that things weren't held onto, that photos weren't held onto, there's, there has been a bit of an idea that that all changes in a sense when things are digital, when mm. things are easy to store, when they're, when they're all there and easy to access. Mm. But uh, even um, in terms of the environment, in terms of the amount of energy it takes to run all of these servers, there must come a point where, uh, or will there we come to a point where we have to decide how much we keep and how much we don't? Will we be back in that same position? I, I mean, I think 
there are science fiction extrapolations that talk about, well, what happens when you start turning all of the matter in the solar system into something smart where we can store it? So I don't think we're going to hit those kinds of limits um, anytime soon. I think in terms of the practical implications of that, though, um, what's going to make a difference is that there's an awful lot of work out there that is where you get sort of anonymous results back from Google or you get recommendations from Amazon or wherever. Um, the thing that I think will be the most interesting is, is essentially a Web 2.0 kind of technology in some ways, and it also goes back to the, the topic tonight, which is the, the curated experience. So the way that people can make sense of the world through trusted individuals who they, they know, they have a long-standing relationship with. And we're only at the start of that kind of, of possibility, where there are voices that we choose to listen to who... Um, whose content we trust, who, who we've got a, a, a relationship with over time. And I think that notion of curated content um, is go what's going to make the difference, help us to make sense of the, the digital deluge, if you like. OK, let's take some questions from you out there. I, I really need to buy myself glasses. I've been telling myself that for about a year. <laughs> it's very apparent to me tonight that I actually need to go out and do it. I'm finding it hard to see, but if we're our... Uh, we've got a question over here. Maybe if we take a question here. If you wouldn't mind just saying your first name and also just directing the question to, to one of the panel members, if that's all right. Can I start off? Is that, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Barry's my name, and uh, thanks for the uh, panel tonight. Um, I think what people yearn for uh, and what they is uh, quality content, and I think that the web allows that. And just talking about the theme about art galleries... Um, interacting with the community. Um, the ABC, I'll just go to a specific last year, cleverly ran a competition with the Art Gallery of West Australia last year um, where on T Tony Dolroy's nightlife program you could win a trip to Perth and see the new exhibition. And the way they did that was they put on a picture that was coming over and people had to comment on, on it and then when they did that, they had, there were three curators from around Australia, including Art Gallery New South Wales, and they made an appraisal of what people commented on. And um, so I thought that was a clever use of, um, of, of the internet. You know, with, but my point was, what happens like with something like Huffington Post, which has been sold this week, where crowdsourcing, where you've got people blogging and putting in their their content onto, a, onto something like Huffington Post and then they decide to sell it. What happened? Mm. What do you think about that? <laughs> giving their comment for free, giving their time and labour for That's free. That's right, Only yes. to have it sold for, I think it was $312 million or Yes. Yeah. Uh, who did you want to direct that to? Uh, look, anybody that can who answer Who wants it? to pick up on that? <laughs> Any points on that? Jason. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I you moved your lips. I That's did. right. <laughs> I keep coming back to this notion where we're talking about marketing on the web and crowdsourcing and co-creation. Um, I'll out myself as being a cynic and a sceptic. A um, colleague of mine back in the early 2000s, Mackenzie Walk, who now teaches at the New School, used to walk around saying capitalism is the will to virtuality made real. And so <laughs> what he means by that is the more we can put things online, the better that is for capitalism, the more efficiently capitalism will run. And I kind of believe him. And I kind of think a lot of what we're seeing in terms of um, co audience co-creation, in terms of social marketing and those types of things, uh, I mean, the thing with having ordinary people, and I know Ian's probably just going to punch me in a minute, but the thing with having an ordinary person as an actor is you don't have to pay them union rates. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a cynical view, but, I, but, it, but it is there, you know, my colleagues at QUT have done a lot of research in, in that area and it's a real tension between, you know, making money and intellectual property yeah. rights. Ian, picking up on that point, we do need to go to another uh, question, but... No, I think it's right. I think there's a, there's a tension there and, it, and, that, and the jewellery's still out on, on where it will get to. There's, there's still a, a significant demand for models and actors and probably will be for some time to come, but... There's, there's probably better ways to use, you know, real people with real experiences who also look, at, look half decent, yeah. I should have said there's a couple of... <laughs> <laughs> depending on what your brand is. <laughs> there are a couple of microphones on either side, so put up your hand or just signal if you, um, if you want to take 
a question. We'll, we'll go here first. Uh, while we're doing that, there's another um, uh, tweet that I can read. Uh, well, it says, is the, is the virtual social network leading to a devaluation of real social relations? I guess that's a question that's been asked, or well, we've heard a lot of over the last couple of years. We might just quickly answer that before we go there. Ian, but what's I, your, what's I, mean, I, I find that really problematic. I don't see how a virtual social relationship is not real. That's the mm. bit that I don't kind of get about that. To me, it's an it's a issue, or, or what it's about is people have social relationships and they manifest in a whole range of ways and they, they perpetuate them and conduct them through whatever media they may choose to, to do. Uh, so, I suppose so to we, me, it's a real social relationship. I suppose we forget the point, don't we, that before the internet there was still a telephone. And yeah, people had social health. relationships across yeah. phones or, or via correspondence. Yeah, uh, yeah. people played chess by, by post and now they play chess through email or they play chess in real time through the... It doesn't... It's still a social relationship. Uh, let's take that question up there and... Um, yes. Oh, hi, uh, my, my name's Ian. Sorry, just a little bit louder, Ian. Oh, hi, um, yep, my name's Ian. Um, my question was around... Uh, obviously, one, one of the, the things that seems to be essential to Web 2.0 is collaboration or communication um, in, a, in a distributed sense where the individual <coughs> can communicate with a collective in some way, whether anonymously or not, where the collective can communicate with the individual. You know, so companies can have a Facebook page or a Twitter account. I guess, I mean, one of the things that seems to have happened with this is that it's, it's intensified the question of privacy and the idea of the commons and intellectual property. And I'm wondering, I mean, is there going to be a, a crisis point where, because there's a, so, in, in a sense, a lack of direction about policy around this, will there, will there be a, a, a moment when, you know, that, that conflict between the commons and between people who want to exploit the commons, will that come to a head? Did you want to direct that to anyone uh, in to, particular? To anybody who'd like to take that up. One of you brave souls? Mm. <laughs> well, the, I think the answer is that it's, it's going to come to a head and it already is in micro, micro circumstances. Um, the, the, real, the real issue here is, and one of the things, and one of the things that Web 2.0 has changed, is that people now trade in, people are now more willing to trade in social capital. So collaborating on something with a professional media organisation and getting a byline or seeing your video um, uploaded on the website, there is, for, for some people, for some people, there is as much value in that as being paid $100. Mm. Now, you know, my students will do those sorts of things all the time because there's having... There's status the, in it. Yeah. There's status in yeah. it and it's good for your, it's good for your CV. Um, I, I, I don't know. I think people are, I think people are happy. People know how capitalism works, and I think people are willing. People don't go into those transactions with their eyes closed. So I know. I think they know that they're never going to get be fully rewarded from them. I guess the other question I'd have about that is, what's the grass in the in the case of the web? So what's the resource that's going to get destroyed through overgrazing? Because um, that's not entirely clear to me as a general principle um, what it is that's going to be consumed to the detriment of the, of the collective, I guess. Um, so I'm not sure it's a really good analogy necessarily. We've still got uh, time for a couple more questions. So put up your hand, just let the, the people with the microphones know. Uh, take a question down here. Um, I'm Min. Um, uh, just adding to that list of ways people communicate, um, letters by sailing ship between betrothed yeah. couples. Yeah. It doesn't matter. They were social relationships. So mm. just want to add that one. Um, I, I'm a bit disappointed in the discussion because it's Web 2 and it's almost like it's a, an historical analysis of it or a Royal Commission into the implementation <laughs> of Web 2 <laughs> in schools. You know, just it's really what's coming next it's because it's future tense. You know, so what is coming next? And curation is is the really and mo and, and mobile is the really interesting area. And Africa has been grasping mm. mobile for a really long time. They they grabbed the mobile phone straight away, yeah. and have been in their own way developing educational programs using the mobile phone. How to build a solar powered water still? You know, really practical things, and and solving the problem of how to. Um, charge the, them up, but people would walk to the place where you could charge them. So that's been happening for the last, you know, I don't know, four or five years, mm -hmm. you know, quite a long time in terms of the technology. But in terms of where we're going, I was really disappointed the way Web2 um, 
got hold of the, the debate because it's so incremental and yeah. what's happening is exponential. Mm. And to, to even, can we please, can the ABC not use Web3? It would be fantastic. <laughs> you know, let's find it. The semantic web never made it into, into common parliament. Because it's too that, difficult to understand, yeah, isn't it? Is, it, it is, it is. I, I think, quite, quite properly yeah. it didn't. But it was an interesting idea and I would have liked to see some more discussion on it at, at you know, levels, but we need to think of it in a different way. Um, and please, can we not call them Gen Zs or anything like that and at least give them something like the net generation? That's another incremental thing. Right. But curation is where I want to go. And that's and you're talking about trust, and it, it's more than trust, merely interesting or entertaining or amusing. But I think where we're going is we're all going to be curators. Mm. Yeah. Well, Ian, I, do you want to pick up on that? Well, I mean, I think that that's... I, I think that un, uh, contains a whole series of kind of questions, and it, and it raises questions for organisations like the gallery that I think Andrew was, was alluding to to some extent, that the nature of expertise in a gallery context is a very particular thing, and the degree to which um, organisations and, and people whose job title includes the word curator open themselves up to the kinds of possibilities, we're only just beginning to scratch the surface. So the British Museum has only just had its first Wikipedian in residence, and that's involved a whole series of conversations around what is the nature of expertise? What is it that Wikipedians bring to an organisation that has a tradition around curation and expertise around a collection and so on? So um, I think it's a really interesting time. I don't, I'm, I don't have a, a kind of crystal ball no. to say where it's going to go, but I think it's, it is really interesting and I think it will be incremental as well. So, and yeah. there'll be lenses put across yep. Various yep. things. So, if you're looking to buy a car, there'll, there'll be that. You know, are you looking from from a, d a dad father to buy for their daughter, or are you the daughter buying it? Different lenses is which sort of information you're looking for, and the same with the piece of art. You know, are you trying That's to understand? Too. Well, it, it isn't, isn't it? If you've got your um, preferences built into your kind of filtration model, then you're getting more relevant content to recommend what to do. Yeah. We, too, I yeah. See. We'll have to wrap up, but we've probably got time for one last question. If there's somebody, another a final question. Yes. Hi, thank you very much. My name is Nadia. Uh, I have a comment and a question, if I may. I was a student of Dr. Jason Sternberg's about five years ago, and I had a wonderful education. It was a, a classic communication education. Um, I've now entered the workforce. I've been working for the state government for a few years, and we don't explore these capabilities. We don't coin these terms. Facebooking, blogging, Twittering. In my personal life, I don't, I don't use it either, neither, um, to, to be honest. Jobs for communications advisors today in 2011 have a requirement for these skills. You need to be equipped with them. If you don't, your education is dated. Yep. So I'd just like to ask what the future is for students with a, if I may, say classic communication education who, frankly, are not equipped with these skills. Ian, did you want to pick up? Yeah, okay. Well, I think um, I think they'll adapt. Yeah. Um, people used to be taught how to write letters. You know, you have to put the the address on this side and whatever. There's a format for them, and it's changed every time. And I think that will evolve as well. And so, just like IT geeks, communication specialists will update their skills accordingly. Yeah. And it is an issue for educational institutions. Um, teaching a software package is redundant the minute you open, you install it. Um, so it's about teaching critical thinking skills that are going to allow you to adapt to those to those environments. Um, and it's a very, it's all as I've indicated. Also, it's a very fraught relationship that people have with social software in educational contexts and it's something the educational system at all levels secondary and secondary and tertiary haven't come to grips with yet yeah by the same token communication strategies haven't changed so there's still a messaging thing about you know what's the what's the insight you're trying to convey what's the problem what's the solution so i think those things are still valid and the software tools are helping you know people who don't know how to use them it's a bit easier to use them now than perhaps it was three or four years ago so and unfortunately, that's where we're going to have to wrap it up for, uh, for tonight. Uh, thanks to our panellists. Thanks to Ian Farmer, the managing partner and founder of the Sydney-based agency Frontiering. Uh, writer, blogger, art critic and television presenter, Andrew Frost, whose blog is called The Art Life, uh, if, you, if you haven't uh, already discovered it. 
Ian McColl, the Senior Research Fellow with the Faculty of Science and Technology at the Queensland University of Technology, and Jason Sternberg, uh, also from the Queensland University of Technology, where he's a lecturer in media and communications. Thanks also to uh, Donna McComb and her team from the gallery for organising tonight's event and making sure that it, it ran so smoothly. And thanks to all of you and everyone watching via the, uh, the webcast for your, your comments and also for your attendance. Now, the next GOMA talk will be held on the 3rd of March. So I don't know who's got a pencil out here. Go out straight away and find a pen and write that down or, or go to the, uh, the GOMA website. Remember it, the 3rd of March. The theme that time will be uh, places, what makes up a, a 21st century city and are there any boundaries? And the host for that particular event will be Alan Saunders, who's the presenter of By Design on ABC Radio National. And uh, as I just said, the details for that, though, and also for the uh, other three talks in this series uh, are all available on the, the GOMA website. Um, all I've got to say now is that I'm Anthony Fennell, and thank you very much for joining me. Cheers. Good night. Good night.